ready to begin, um, we're going to um, have an introduction of our speaker, Michael A. Curry Esquire, um, who is a father, an attorney, an activist, a Mac alum, which we, you know, that's awesome. We got, got somebody coming back to us. Um, <laughs> and a past president of the NAACP of Boston, um, a, a native of Boston actually, president and CEO currently of the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers. And uh, Michael is extremely uh, decorated, has been out there in the struggle uh, on so many different levels for all of these years. And we um, were hoping that, um, I need to hear from, I see Elder there and so Elder, this is the moment where you get to um, bring, bring us into a uh, community with Michael Curry since you've known him for a very long time. And uh, we'd like to give you an opportunity to introduce him to us as you know him. Thank you very much, Ngia, for this once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm gonna tell you, I am very nervous about this and I hope I don't lose my composure because Michael Curry is a part of what justifies my existing teacher. He is the McAllister grad where I met him, more than met him, we had more than a teacher-student relationship. We were bound by values that go as far back as our ancestors forming culture in this country. He is a remarkable young man, to say the least. He's a child of the Roxborough neighborhood, the neighborhood where one of our founding fathers once lived, Malcolm X. It is no surprise that Michael is a practicing attorney in the upper echelons of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Anybody who's encountered him can tell you it's like magic, this young man. He is incredible. There are not enough adjectives to describe what I think about him. So I'm going to stop in the interest of time <laughs> and say simply this. Our relationship has been student teacher. He is one of the keenest minds I've ever encountered as a teacher. He's driven by a will to know. That's the key. This results in a large measure beyond our relationship student teacher. Michael and Ira's relationship went beyond the four walls of a classroom. This was an earnest, meaningful relationship that I got as much as I gave from him. He's full of enthusiasm. He is in pursuit of the life of the mind. He's committed himself to that. And what more can I say about him? A lot more, but I want simply to say this. A lot of people think that the chief aim of life is simply to be happy. Such is not the case. <laughs> Michael is this representative of what the chief aim of life really is. The chief aim in life. It's not simply to be happy. Chief aim in life is to be useful, to be responsible, to be compassionate, to make it matter that you lived it all. Here's Michael Kerr. Professor, uh, thank you. 
uh, it is, and, and you say this as you open up speeches, all of us do, an honor and a privilege to be here and to be with you. Uh, but I can tell you, having uh, spoken all across the country on many topics, racial justice issues and healthcare policy and politics in general, um, there is no more humbling experience to speak before your mentor, uh, before somebody who I'm not even sure he knows this was like a father to me, uh, a, a child that did not have a father growing up, that was a father to me in the four years I was in Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, and was struggling as a student, the racial isolation, the challenges of uh, being uh, out of Roxbury in an all black neighborhood and being on a predominantly white campus. Uh, it was Professor El Khadi, who for me, like many other students on that campus served as uh, our, our campus dad, uh, as well as our professor. And I had a chance to go to his office in between classes and he would uh, sit with me, professor. And I would always say, I would make you like 15 minutes late for every class because we were getting such great conversations. Um, but I want to say it's an honor and a blessing to be with you, Sister Sada Brown, Brother Nora, uh, Sister Njia, Lawrence, uh, Hana, of course, the uh, all of the organizers for the Sol Solidarity Twin Cities and the New School for African American Thought. It is no surprise that you are a child of Professor El Khadi. Uh, he is uh, a master at creating people who will take that knowledge and go and share it with other people. So it is no surprise that for the last 10 years or so, you've been hosting these discussions because it is as I tell people all the time, it is like the gospel. Uh, you can learn it, but it's about what you share, right? It's about going out and sharing what you've learned with other people. So uh, I treat Black consciousness the same way that uh, many of us might treat the Bible. Uh, it is a, an ever-ending search for the truth, as well as a sharing of that truth with other people. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in because I want to cover a lot in a short period of time. I want to acknowledge some people that I've asked to join the call as well. Uh, some of my colleagues on the National NAACP Board of Directors, architects of the civil rights movement. Uh, Robin Williams is on the call. Robin Williams is uh, the chair of some of our key commit committees on the uh, national board. She's a labor person. Uh, if you are in the labor movement, Robin Williams is uh, known to you uh, and really champions that call before I begin. Okay. Um, I'm gonna share screen. Okay, so you'll see this. This is the title of the presentation tonight. It is uh, Quantum Leap, the Unmasking of Anti-Black Racism in America. Uh, I'll cover 1619 to today. Um, I will not cover everything. Of course, there's many things in that time period that uh, we just will not have an opportunity in 45 minutes to cover. Uh, you'll see uh, a, a friend of yours and many of you on this call, but a mentee of mine, uh, Leslie Redman in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, she is uh, your former Minneapolis NAAC president, a mentee of mine, uh, and a mentee of Professor Okadi. Uh, and I am actually very humbled that there are about 300 Leslie's, actually now 600 Leslie's across the country, who the national NAACP have trained in civil rights work. Uh, they've gotten much of this history we'll talk about tonight, uh, and they've you know panned out across the country to take over NAACP branches and, and lead with a clear compass about how to do this work uh, and, and our students of civil rights. So I just wanted to acknowledge uh, Leslie as we open up as well. Um, I'm gonna start with an African proverb that says, hunters will cease being heroes when lions have historians. Hunters will cease being heroes when lions have historians. That is Professor Mahmoud el Khati. Uh, Professor Al-Qadi, I've known your history over the years, but I got a chance to sort of dig in a little bit more on your history. Uh, and I think it's important as we talk about uh, anti-Black racism in America from 1619 to today, that we talk about your place in dealing with that history. Mahmoud Al-Qadi, born in 1935 in Savannah, Georgia, son of Rufus Williams and Razi Garvin Williams, one of three siblings, graduated from Booker T. High School in, in Miami, Florida, and later from Wilberforce University, where he majored in contemporary African-American history. From 1970 to 2003, and I'm sure he continues uh, to serve in many other capacities as professor, 
now emeritus, teaching many generations at McAllister College in courses such as Black Experiences, World War II, and sports in the African-American community. I think I took every course that Professor Okadi offered. Um, professor, I made up a number based on, I think, all the years that you taught classes in each semester, but I think over 5,000 students across generations have learned from Professor Okadi and have taken that knowledge, those truths, and as I said, panned out across the world to do battle with racism, ignorance, and oppression. Um, McAllister College established the Mahmoud Al-Qadi Distinguished Lectureship in American Studies in recognition of his scholarly and community work. This endowment is used to bring distinct, distinguished scholars to McAllister for an extended engagement that includes public presentations, classroom appearances, and conversations with students, faculty, and local community. He has a footprint, and I just wanna impress upon those who may be on the call who did not go to McAllister, but you know Professor Mahmoudi, whether you're in St. Cloud or Minneapolis or St. Paul, uh, no matter where you are, folks know the uh, important work that Professor Okadi has done at that time. But I just wanna impress upon you that what he did in those years on that campus is produce a lot of Michael Curtis that are in corporate offices, that are teaching classes, that are in police departments, that are no matter what professions, I've come across people who are now working across this country and quite frankly, across this globe uh, who uh, were in, um, who were uh, students of Professor Okadi. Now I wanna start with something Professor Okadi often share with us in class, which is the history of Carter G. Woodson. But I wanted to reference what he said, Carter G. Woodson told us. He said, history was not the mere gathering of facts. The object of historical study is to arrive at a reasonable interpretation of the facts. I need us to set ourselves as we get ready to have this conversation. It's about arriving at a reasonable interpretation of the facts. This presentation that I call Quantum Leap, you'll see there on the left side, I've been doing it since last year. It started with a Jewish temple that asked me to do a presentation on, on uh, reparations uh, and dealing with all the issues around reparations in response to the Sheila Jackson Lee bill, which she actually uh, took, took up the baton to advance that bill in Congress. Uh, and you'll see there in the last two years, I've been pretty busy, whether it's banks and uh, hospital systems and community health centers and schools and high schools and colleges across the country doing the presentation that you're about to see. Quantum Leap is a collection of historical facts from many sources presented in a chronology that helps audiences, as I say, connect the dots to the racial inequities, disparities, and injustices that continue to plague society. The presentation shockingly went from 15 slides on reparations to over 300 slides that focus on economic inequality in the case for reparations, employment discrimination, health disparities, racial violence, including police violence, education, mental discrimination, and injustice in our criminal justice system. While every presentation includes a snapshot of each of these areas and explains the interconnections, presentations are tailored to the hosting organization. Uh, so I'll do heavy banking and how do we get to the economic inequities when I speak to BNY Mellon or Mellon Bank or when I'm talking to police organizations or uh, criminal justice organizations, the ACLU, I cover and focus more on the issue of the history of our criminal justice system. Uh, so I, I tailor it based on the audience. Now, if you're old enough to remember, which I think many of you on the call are, when I was a, a student at McAllister, there was a TV show that was popular in the late 80s, early 90s called Quantum Leap. It aired first on March 26, 1989. Quantum Leap was an American science fiction television series created by uh, Donald Belisario and originally aired on NBC for five seasons. Here's why I call it Quantum Leap. If you remember the concept of that show, the character Sam Beckett would, Sam, uh, Sam Beckett would jump through time and he would jump into the body of a person and he had to resolve in that time period, in that moment, whatever the circumstance they were dealing with. When I was a student there in Minneapolis, St. Paul, that episode that aired was Sam Beckett jumping into the body of a KKK member and trying to stop the murder of an African-American man. It was called the Justice Episode and May 11th, 1965 was the time period. He leaped into the body of a man named Clyde. Uh, as I mentioned, he was about to, and he and others were about to lynch an African-American. So we were students on the campus back then. I remember we were watching the episode and we talked about if you could jump through time, we were students of Professor Okadi, where would you jump to? 
And I, oddly enough, said I would jump back to slavery. I would want to be with Nat Turner during the slave revolt. I might want to be with Frederick, Frederick Douglass as he made the appeal to end slavery. I might want to be with the 54th Regiment as they set off to fight. I might want to be as those black men took seats in Congress. I might want to be there for the airing of Birth of a Nation. I know my classmates looked at me like I was crazy. What black person would want to jump back into some of the most dangerous, violent periods in American history? But for me, it was about context. So for the purpose of this presentation, I'm asking you to do what we did uh, in Professor Okadi's class, what you do every week when you host sessions, is I'm gonna ask you to quantum leap with me in this conversation, but I'm gonna ask you to do, put the dog outside the room, shut the other laptop off, the, turn the phone off, because in order to really have this conversation, which I hope it will be as we, we turn from the presentation to conversation, I'm asking you to focus in on what some of this, which I know will be new to you. I wanna start with where we are. There's a term called, the researchers call the weathering effect. And when they presented the weathering effect to me as a healthcare policy person, they came in and said, Michael, um, we asked black parents to rate their kids asthma from one to 10. I had asthma. My mother had asthma, my sister had asthma. Actually, many of the black and brown kids in my community had asthma. They said, Michael, we asked parents to rate their kids asthma from one to 10. And many of those black parents, parents rated their asthma four, fives, and six, their kids' asthma. Then we had doctors come in and evaluate those same kids, and they were eight, nines, and tens. They said, that's the concept of the weathering effect that you can get so used to taking the Allupent and Flovent every day and several times a day, you get so used to being in the emergency room like I was every month or every quarter that you become weathered to being sick. You become weathered to being stopped by the police. You become weathered to auntie and uncle and them dying of diabetes and heart disease and cancer and lupus at a higher rate living five, 10, 15 years shorter, not being able to raise their kids, build wealth, transfer wealth. You become weathered to being followed around stores in Minneapolis, St. Paul, like there was once in Carson Perry Scott. You, be, you become weathered to, uh, oops, we made a mistake when they put that incendiary device through a black couple's home in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and murdered that black couple who burned alive in that apartment when I was a student there. So I asked the question for you on the call tonight, what have you become weathered to? 192 million cases of COVID-19 worldwide with over 4.1 million deaths and over 3.5 billion vaccine doses administered. Over 34.2 million cases here in the US with over 607,000 deaths with over 162.2 million fully vaccinated. Approximately 609 1,400 cases in Minnesota, greater than 126,000 just in Hennepin County with over 7,650 deaths with over 3 million fully vaccinated. 53.2% of the black and African-American population. What have you become weathered to? I often think about that as a child at Roxbury when people would get shot in our neighborhoods and, and white residents and other communities would say, why aren't they running in the street? Why aren't they protesting? Their kids are dying, they should be upset. And I used to have to try to explain to people what it becomes when you become weathered because you don't control city hall, because you don't control the police departments or child services and all those, I call them the social determinants of violence, as we call the social determinants of health. What creates a violent child? What makes the drive-by shooting? And many people in communities like Southside Chicago or North Minneapolis or Roxbury get paralyzed because we don't control the systems that sometimes creates that violence. So I ask you, what have you become weathered to? Equity issues, access to timely racial and ethnic data. We know we failed. We didn't know who was dying, especially in our communities, because the data wasn't being collected. Protection for healthcare and essential workers. We are the healthcare and essential workers. Access to PPE. They told us put a scarf over your face because they didn't want us to go after N95s and KN95s. In fact, we were the closest to the disease. Access to timely and reliable information. We weren't getting the information we needed when we needed it. Equitable asset access to testing and contact tracing and alternatives for isolation. I know what it means to grow up in the projects. 
We didn't have anywhere else to go in a pandemic. We had small houses, grandparents, uncles, cousins lived around us. Where are you gonna isolate? Access to resources, mortgage, rent relief, food, supplies, childcare, digital divide. Then and now in the pandemic, we now teach remotely. We get healthcare remotely. Some of us can work remotely. So the access issues become even more prevalent now because do black people have an equal access to education in this moment? Equal access to the job in this moment, equal access to medical care in this moment. And then we know that black people are also immigrants as well. The chilling effects caused by the many Trump and actually many democratic anti-immigrant policies that existed way before Donald Trump. Public charge under Donald Trump. That rhetoric that drove black and brown immigrants into the shadows and even off of Medicaid, mass health roles, uh, mass health is what the system is in other states. And then diversity and vaccine trials and equity and distribution and hesitancy. That's where we are. I just wanna calibrate us before we start quantum leaping as to where we are today. The pandemic's racial disparities. You saw it play out in Minneapolis, St. Paul or wherever you are in Minnesota. COVID-19 deaths per 100,000 people in the US. We know as uh, our Congresswoman Ayanna Presley says, those closest to the pain should be closest to the power. I flipped out a little bit and I said, those closest to the, to the disease should be closest to the vaccine, but that didn't happen. So you'll see just some quick data there that we know that we are being hospitalized, we were infected and we were dying at higher rates. And then as a vaccine was put online, we were also not closest to the vaccine. That same data played out in Minneapolis, St. Paul and in Minnesota. Uh, you can go to your Minnesota Public of Health and you can look at these statistics. I'm not shocking you, you've heard the data. All the direct and indirect impacts of COVID, we need to have a conversation about because these are ripple effects for generations, the loss of savings and retirement plans, closure of black and Latinx businesses. The number of active black owned businesses fell some 41% between February and April of last year by one count compared to 22% overall decline. I think that number is up to 50% a year and, a, and some months later. Increase in the homeless population. We're now more food insecure, mental health and trauma. We know we are already traumatized. Traumatized by racism, traumatized by the violence in our community. Uh, but now even the, the thought of our mortality traumatizes us. The adverse impact on credit scores and the loss of wealth. These are all issues that are quite frankly the tsunami that's created in the wake of COVID-19. Uh, Professor Okadi knows this quote of Dr. King's of all the forms of inequality and justice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. That is a quote from him at the Convention for Medical Committee for Human Rights held in Chicago, March, 1966. I want you to quantum leap with me for a second. Some history that very few people know. The lessons of history. The Spanish flu, also known as the 1918 flu pandemic, was an unusually deadly influenza pandemic that lasted from January 1918 to December 1920, infecting 500 million people worldwide, over a quarter of the world's population with 5 million deaths, 635,000 just here in the United States. In 1918, different than 2021, we hadn't discovered flu viruses. There were no lab tests to detect it. There were no vaccines. And there was a poor infrastructure and life-saving tools. But I need you to know something in the context of this presentation. In 1918, we were just a few decades out of slavery. We were under the heels of Jim Crow. We were also living in deplorable living conditions. There was a lack of access to health care. African Americans were extremely susceptible to outbreak. We were dealing with chronic conditions in the early part of that century. We were housing and food insecure during this period of time, we were financially unstable because of the system of Jim Crow. We didn't have access to supplies and medication like white Americans did. We were incarcerated. So as we talk about Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, understanding how there were systems to incarcerate us even in this period of time is critical to understand how the, the Spanish flu impacted us in 1918. We couldn't shelter in place. We were essential workers back then as well. And the death toll in the spring of 19, 1918 was pretty severe. But I want you to know as, as black folks on this call, we've all grown up with that saying, when white America catches the cold, black America catches the flu. So I've been asking this question in this presentation all over the country, what happens when white America catches COVID-19? We die at higher rates. Some of the same politics, who wears a mask, Democrat, Republican, who believes there's a pandemic, 
Is it real? Is it government uh, fabrication? It's one of the reasons they call it the Spanish flu because countries during that period of time ignored the disease, tried to act like it wasn't really happening because we were in the middle of a world war. The reason that it's called the Spanish flu is Spain was one of the first countries to acknowledge that we had a public health crisis, a pandemic. So we see those same politics play out now as folks don't wanna recognize that this is real. So I always tell people the past is prologue, that Shakespearean line. We don't tend to learn from history, so we repeat it. I want you to quantum leap to a place that very few people ever wanna go. And because you're all uh, followers and students of Professor Okadi, you forced yourself to go here, which is slavery. I find it 98% of the people I know don't even know what slavery was. Like they think they know. They thought they watched Roots and they had some concept of slavery, but they don't have a real understanding of slavery. So in this presentation, I give folks a sense of what slavery was though 1619. And even though there's records of slaves that existed before 1619 in this country, the 20 or so odd African slaves that arrived in 1619. I introduced them to the 250 or so mutinies upon those slave ships, the recorded mutinies on those slave ships of Africans that sought to free themselves. Why is it in American history as we celebrate people who are liberators, people who fought to free themselves from no taxation without representation from, um, uh, from uh, imperial rule? Why do we not celebrate those Africans, some of whom jumped off the side of that ship rather than be slaves? Why do we not celebrate those mutinies, those 250 beyond that movie Amistad that maybe many of you have seen? In Boston, we argued uh, in the last two years over whether we should put a, 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 a monument of some type in Faneuil Hall Marketplace. If you've never been to Boston, that's a downtown area where there's a lot of shopping, but it was also the arrival uh, place for slaves. It was where they auctioned slave off, slaves off. And there was a debate here because an African-American artist wanted to put a monument, a slave auction in Faneuil Hall to recognize that history. But there was a debate here, a, a debate where the NAACP Boston branch and many activists said, no, we walked through that mall, we walked through the, the, the uh, shopping area, we don't wanna see, we're still traumatized by slavery, generations later. But we want you to know the history. We want you to understand what slavery was. We want it in every museum, in every, in every history book, in every classroom, in every discussion. But maybe we're not ready to walk down streets and see auction blocks in shopping areas. The image of slavery, and I don't know, Professor Okadi, if, if your students have ever gone to Great Blacks and Wax in Baltimore or the, the relatively new museum in DC, but I need you to go and visit and, and see what the images of life-size life images of slavery look like, the stacking and pack, packing of black bodies on slave ships. There's nothing like talking about it, but there's nothing like seeing it. What it, what it looked like, the, the tight spaces, the disease that were rampant on those ships because they didn't have food, because they were deplorable conditions, the death rate on that transatlantic slave trade, the cruelty of those handlers that uh, transported those slaves across the Atlantic Ocean. We have yet to tell that story. Uh, I have this debate with all the people, people all the time because they think about the slaves in the United States and they, they don't get the number right. They think of slavery as just the millions that were transported into the colonies that would become the United States, but they don't think about the millions of slaves that were transported across the Atlantic Ocean into the Americas. So if you're on this call in your Honduran or Jamaica where I just came back from and they introduced me to the plantations in Jamaica or in South America or Brazil, then you know the footprint of the African slave trade and how pervasive slavery was throughout the Americas and, and quite frankly beyond the Americas. But as we have this conversation about uh, the millions of black bodies that were transported across the Atlantic Ocean. Now I wanna just quantum leap for a second into this period of time and talk about the value, the market value of slaves. That's a conversation very few people have ever had. Because in order to understand why slavery became so difficult to end, and why even after 1865, why so many people fought to keep the institution in place under another name, you have to understand the value. Near 4 million slaves with a market value estimated to be between 3.1 and $3.6 billion lived in the US just before the Civil War. 
Masters enjoyed the rate of return on slaves comparable to, the, to those of other assets, cotton consumers as an example. A whole system of, of business was uh, wound and intertwined with the system of slavery. Our insurance companies and in, industrial enterprises benefited from slavery as well. Valuable property required rules to protect it. Our legal system was built around the slave system, political and legal institutions that validated the ownership of other persons. So I want us to take that in mind as we start talking about the infrastructure bill that you hear President Biden and others talking about. We talk about two trillion, about uh, investments in roads and bridges. We're talking about 18th century, 19th century dollars, 3.1 and 3.6 billion dollars. We're talking about property. We're talking about a system where we weren't human beings and we were no different from cattle. Now, I always tell people when we talk about, we just celebrated Independence Day, and this is no new conversation for the folks on this call, but I challenge white audiences with this all the time. I said, hey, every year we celebrate 1776 Independence Day. But the reality is African people, people of African descent weren't, weren't, weren't liberated in 1776. So we wanna have a real conversation about history. Maybe it should be 1863 as well, or 1865, or maybe 1964. There are many other periods in history that we can actually mark as, as a true Independence Day. But yet, uh, of course, we're ha now having this reckoning with American history. In 1788, the US Constitution is ratified under it, slaves are considered by law to be three fifths of a person. This is after 1776. 1808, President Thomas Jefferson officially ends the African slave trade, but domestic slave trade, particularly in the Southern states, begins to grow. This is where they're breeding slaves. The cruelty of slavery. Southern law governs slaves as well as slave owners. What few due process, the right to be heard, protections that slaves possess stem from desires to grant rights to masters. Slaves face harsh penalties for their crimes, when slaves committed crimes, the law sometimes had to subvert property rights of masters in order to preserve slavery as a social institution. Slave crimes included violating curfew, attending religious meetings without a master's consent, running away. Indeed, a slave was not even permitted off the master's farm or business without an owner's permission. In rural areas, a slave was required to carry a written pass to leave the master's. And of course, you've seen and heard this. Southern states erected numerous punishment for slave crimes, including prison terms banishment, whipping, castration, and execution. You will see the ultimate execution in the top right-hand corner, that European uh, penalty, that punishment is the drawing and quartering of a man, the pulling apart of a man's body. We're not talking about James Byrd in Texas. We're talking about the institution of slavery that resulted in harsh penalty for, for African people. Now, I always ask this question, particularly white audiences, but I, I even want, as you as a, a Black audience, to have this, this thought. As we sit here right now in 2021, and you can turn on MSNBC or CNN, and you can look across the globe, and I want you to ask yourself, the evil that men do, and women, today, the genocide, the terrorist attacks, the, the gas uh, attacks, the uh, oppression of people. And I want you to think about the 19th century when we weren't even human beings. So you could justify that kind of cruelty, the rape, the violence, because we weren't even full human beings. So I just want you to take that context. And I, I love to present this slide because I added it because of Mahmoud, Professor al uh, He introduced me to Nat Turner. But I always think it's a contradiction that no, that very few people talk about Nat Turner. And I'll be honest, even when I was a student on campus and we would talk about Nat Turner, you get a little uncomfortable because we've all been sort of programmed to not even talk about his history. Nathaniel Nat Turner, 1800 to 1831, was born on a plantation in Virginia, slave to Benjamin Turner. Nat learned to read and write in his childhood. It's a, it's a shame that the controversy around Nate Parker didn't give the kind of attention that Birth of a Nation, his movie, somewhat misnamed, but that his movie deserved in order to learn about Nate, Nat Turner. Was sold three times and through religion, became a fiery preacher, often expected to deliver the message of subjugation and black inferiority. 
On August 21st, 1831, on a plantation in Southampton County, Virginia, Turner led a rebellion of enslaved people when he joined six others in killing Master Joseph Travis and his family, seizing arms and supplies, enlisting the support of approximately 75 other slaves in what was described as an insurrection. The revolt would eventually result in the murder of 60 white people, the ultimate crime in the antebellum South. After an unsuccessful rebellion, Turner fled, hid for six weeks until captured, convicted, and hung, and dissected, and played, along with 16 of his supporters. Hundreds of others were punished. It put fear into the hearts of white Southerners, resulting in even harsher penalties. But here's some other stuff that I think you might not know. As we sit here and talk about, give me liberty or give me death. America was born out of violent protests against tyranny. Taxation without representation and oppressive government action, as well as out of violent rhetoric. As I said, live free or die. Give me liberty or give me death. Rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God. March 5th, 1770, British troops fired into a crowd of angry American colonists in Boston, where I sit right now, not just a few yards from where I am, who were reported to be taunting them, resulting in the death of five white colonists. There was tension at the time because those British soldiers would also take the jobs of those colonists. So there was a lot of tension. And, and the story goes that Christmas addicts and those other men were in a bar at that time, uh, had sort of spilled down into the street with their frustration and anger. But that moment that took place later that would result in the death of those men became known as the Boston Massacre. This would fuel the campaign against British rule and eventually give birth to the American Revolution. This is history you got in the books. That's one of the the 10 paragraphs we got in the books. Christmas Addicts, an African-American sailor, whaler, mulatto, rope maker, former slave, was the first of those killed that day. That's the stuff we learned. Here's what you didn't know. John Adams, future president, 1797 to 1801, was the attorney for the British soldiers. And you'll see the quote there as he said, it was a motley rabble of saucy boys, Negroes and mulattoes, Irish teagues and outlandish jack -tops. And he claimed that addicts provoked the altercation. You didn't know that. Addicts was taller than the average American man of this period. He was 6'2". It's argued at that time that the average man was 5'6", five, 5'8". Five five, and he was described by the British soldiers as a man of great physique, which Adams was around 5'7", as he used this argument in court. He used that along with his race to justify the killing and their reasonable perception of threat. I, I threw that phrase in because those are modern day terms, but this was the argument that John Adams gave in that courtroom. Of course they had to kill him. Of course they had to shoot him. He was a threat. George Floyd, Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, Ahmaud Arbery, and the list goes on and on. The trial transcript records a statement describing Addicts as a quote, stout mulatto, mulatto fellow whose very looks was enough to terrify any person. You'll see this quote there from Atlantic, June 2020. And this is an important quote for this conversation today. Some 250 years later, Adams's words still underlie a central truth in American disobedience. Freedom through violence is a privilege possessed only by whites. Seminal moments in US history that historians have divine, defined as patriotic were also moments that denied patriotism to black people. John Adams once said in reference to the colonist treatment by the British, we won't be their Negroes. The jury acquitted six of the soldiers on all charges and two were found not guilty of murder, but guilty of manslaughter. Trayvon Martin, you know the story. I won't cover this as I do for some audiences that don't know the story and need to know that he was characterized as an aspiring street tough and a would-be thug and trying to show him and accept. He was the closest we get to perfect because no child is perfect. Children aspire to be great children and, and become a great adult, but we make mistakes like all kids do. But the problem with our justice system is you gotta be perfect to get justice. And in his case, he was as close as you get and he still didn't get justice. George Zimmerman is walking the street right now and he murdered that boy. Ahmaud Aubrey. I'm not gonna cover that because of sake of time, but you know that story, right? Modern day lynching went to check out the house maybe and just take a look as he's jogging. I jog and I might've looked in real quick to say, wow, I like the way they're putting this house together and 
and maybe I want to do this with my house one day. And they followed him and they murdered him. We're not talking about 1863. We're not talking about 1920. We're talking about modern day lynching. The origins of policing in this country. The earliest slave patrol was created in the Carolinas in 1704 and spread throughout the 13 colonies. To establish a system of terror in response to slave uprising with the capacity to pursue and apprehend and return runaway slaves to their owners, including the use of excessive force to control and produce desired slave behavior. Slave patrols were allowed wide latitude to pursue, capture, assault, and murder slaves, including the forcible entry to any home solely based on suspicion of protecting runaway slaves. That even pulled in the abolitionists who would get caught in this moment of, of police patrol, slave patrols. Slave patrols in, in continued until the end of the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment. I won't cover this slide, but I, I do this for transportation. I'll, I'll just mention it. our transportation. I always use the phrase, we built this city. In the 19th century, Southern slave owners were the principal stockholders and directors of many of our railroad companies. The South moved quickly in the 1830s to build railroads. Southerners built some of the earliest and longest railroads in the nation. By the 1850s, Southern railroad construction was in full swing with crews grading thousands of miles of track during slavery. Companies purchased slaves to work on the railroads. You didn't know this, but as early as 1838, a Southern railroad company purchased 140 slaves for $159,000 to work on constructing a railroad, railroad line in Mississippi. Uh, historian Theodore Cornweevil uh, had the use of slave labor on over 75% of Southern railroads and estimated that over 10,000 slaves a year were working on the railroads in the South between 1857 and 1865. I want you to keep that in mind as we get ready to invest in infrastructure if Congress can get a bill passed. Now I want you to know as we talk about who takes a vaccine, who doesn't trust the science, why we won't go and get tested or contact traced, or right now somebody's been sitting on this call and may not even want to get a vaccine. I want to introduce you to Anna Lucy and Betsy. It's depicted in that picture in the upper right hand corner. Those three black women who were experimented on by J. Marion Sims. Now, if you didn't know, now you know. J. Marion Sims is the father of gynecology. In any medical class, if you're talking about medical advancements, they would be talking about J. Marion Sims, 1813 to 1883. Developed the groundbreaking tools and surgical techniques related to women's reproductive health. He invented the vaginal speculum, a tool used for dilation and examination, practicing at a time when treating women was considered distasteful and rarely done. You didn't experiment. You didn't take these kind of experiments on white women. You couldn't do it unless they were at risk of death. But you had many African Americans experiment on. Now, I want you to, as I talk this uh, part of history, I always talk about Auschwitz and Dachau. I talk about Nazi Germany because we know that story. We know that there were exper experiments by the Nazis where they were, they were trying new medical techniques. They didn't care if you died. But we've not even scratched the surface on telling the story about the many. James got their titles and their experience and their training off of killing us, off of experimenting on us. He pioneered a surgical technique to repair vesicle vaginal fistula, a common 19th century complication of childbirth in which a tear between the uterus and the bladder caused constant pain and urine leakage. It, it, leakage. If you were going across this country, particularly in Central Park, a few years ago, you would have saw J. Marion Sims' statue. But we're in a different time now, right? We're ready to, to climb up poles and tear down flags. We want monuments. We turn down monuments now, y'all. They tore down that statue to J. Marion Sims in Central Park. Those statues are coming down of Robert E. Lee and so many others that quite frankly, I tell people all the time, if I went to the Robert E. Lee High School as a black kid and I was walking around with my Robert E. High, e. High School jacket on and all of a sudden I had this racial consciousness, I'd be real mad right about that because I was gaslighted, I was lied to. I wanna share this quote, racial justice has been elusive in part because African-Americans have been unable to tell our stories or control the construction and distribution of our own narrative. That's why I always reference the 1993 article in the Boston Globe where a famous, well-respected uh, um, writer, columnist, wrote an article about Roxbury where I grew up and he said, it's where the beasts prowl the street. He was talking about the violence at that time, but he was using 
uh, that reference of beast to talk about where young black boys walked around in the, in the community with no home training, with violence in their heart. He called it where the beasts prowl the street. I won't spend much time here because you all know and this awareness that we now have on what Juneteenth was and, and, and the history around Juneteenth. I'm gonna skip that so we can cover much more. Uh, but this is something you may not know that the flag around Juneteenth was born out of Boston. That a brother Ben Haith created that flag and the, the, the um, Abraham Lincoln uh, reference here, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Reconstruction. Now I'm gonna tell you, uh, Professor Okadi, I always introduce reconstruction as the Obama years. And you gotta appreciate the Obama years and the reference to understand why I call reconstruction the Obama years. Because as you know, during reconstruction, 1865 to 1877 is the period after which the civil war where attempts were made to redress the inequities of slavery and its political and social economic legacy and to solve the problems arising from the readmission to the union of the 11 states that had seceded at or before the outbreak of the war. This was our time, right? This was our opportunity to end slavery. We ended slavery somewhat, 1863 to 1865. We now know the Juneteenth story. We knew slavery took another form, but during this period of reconstruction, there were a lot of promises made. Sweeping changes in America's political life from new laws, including constitutional amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th amendment, that significantly altered systems in the definition of American citizenship. During Reconstruction, some 2,000 African-Americans held public office. Now, we're not talking about uh, uh, Kamala Harris and Barack Obama and, 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 and uh, James Clyburn. We're talking about the 19th century during Reconstruction, 2,000 African-Americans from everyone from sheriffs to, to legislatures in states like uh, North Carolina, all the way up to Congress were taking seats in halls of government. Politically mobilized black people joined with white allies to bring the Republican party. And it, this is a, a recalibration for those that don't know the history, right? Democrat versus Republican, right? Cause you're not, we can challenge both parties, right? With, with their history around race. But just it's, a, it's about understanding that this period of time was the party of Lincoln, the Republican party, uh, that as we ended slavery was the party that brought these major developments into play uh, during the 19th century. You may not know about the Homestead Act, signed into law by President Lincoln on May 20th, 1862, the second year of the Civil War, encouraged Western migration by providing settlers 160 acres of public land. Homesteaders had to pay a filing fee with the application, required to pay five years of continuous residence before receiving ownership of the land, had the option of purchasing the land from the government for $1.25 per acre. All US citizens, women, African-Americans, free slaves and immigrants were eligible to apply for a homestead. The Homestead Act led to the distribution of, and I need you to get this as we talk about land and uh, building wealth, and we talk about the wealth inequality in this country, distribution of 80 million acres of public land by 1900. And then there was the Southern Homestead Act, special order number 15, ordered the confiscation of property of Confederate held lands. This was, a, this was the uh, taking of land from those uh, folks who were disloyal to the union, those rebels, and then redistributing that land, stretching from South Carolina to Florida, as far as Georgia. The order sought to redistribute 400 acres of land to the newly freed black families in 40 acre segments. That's what uh, Professor Okadi introduced us to with 40 acres and way before uh, Spike Lee. The order called for the settlement of black families on confiscated land, encouraged freedmen to join the union and designated a general officer to act as the inspector of settlements. These are some faces, know their names, know their stories. You should know who Hiram Revel is as he ascended into the halls of the Senate. Those 2000 black men on every level that became, and, and just so we know that there was sexism at this time and women didn't have that you should know that there are stories that are shared with these black men where they went back to their communities and they had meetings around what they should do, vote on, what issues they should bring to those, to those uh, positions of power. I need you to know about Rebecca Lee Crumpler. She had sage advice for that time that's still relevant for us today. She said, they seem to forget there's a cause for every ailment, way before we talk, started talking about social determinants of health, and that it may be in their power to remove it. 
1864, she became the first African-American woman to become a doctor of medicine in the US, the only female physician author of the 19th century. And she published a book of medical discourse. Why am I bringing her up? Because we need to know this history. She served during Reconstruction in the Freedmen's Bureau, providing medical care to former slaves. Now, if you think it's hard for a sister in 2021, imagine what it was like in 1864 for a sister to become the first African-American woman to become a doctor of medicine in the US, post-slavery. This was us, other stuff that Professor Okada gave us. Civil War opened the door to the 13th Amendment, formally abolishing the practice of slavery in the US. After emancipation, ex-slaves had little to no formal education, no financial means, no property, residence, keys to economic independence. Special field order number 15, 40 acres and a mule was blocked. This was the, the retrenchment after Abraham Lincoln's murder. Now, you know, I always talk about unwilling heroes. I'm gonna take this liberty to do footnote. I mentioned Abraham Lincoln. I, I may even enter, mention the Kennedy family later in his presentation. But we all know that there's no perfect heroes because the real heroes was the black folks that pushed the issue, that ch ca uh, campaign that challenged uh, folks to do the right thing, including Abraham Lincoln. So I always have to recalibrate on history to make sure that people don't forget about Frederick Douglass or Ida B. Wells. For, uh, slaves were forced into other forms of slavery, debt peonage. I always make the reference to imagine you're a slave and you're told that you're now free, but then the slave master says to you, because we know the market value of slaves, oh, by the way, you owe me for the land you lived on. You owe me for the food I provided you and you can't leave until you pay off that debt. Sharecropping, tenancy farming, convict leasing, these are all terms we didn't get in our history books, but we now need to force the issue. We need to force the conversation that America have a true reckoning about American history and how we got these economic divides, how we got these health disparities, how we got all of these issues today that there's no context for. Black codes, laws intended to restrict the freedom of African Americans and to maintain the availability of cheap labor force after slavery was abolished. Slavery didn't fully end because we understand the economics of that now. We had to keep them, they had to keep those slaves in place because if there's a mass exodus, it would have been a crumbling of the, the Southern economy. Often the codes required former slaves to sign yearly labor contracts. Refusing to sign could result in arrest, fines, and forced unpaid labor. Uh, I do cover this later slave patrols, which followed um, um, uh, in, the, in the history of policing, chain gangs, another part of history I won't cover because of time, uh, maybe other than knowing that um, you know, we didn't start with the new Jim Crow, uh, and how black codes and Jim Crow created a, a labor force uh, for our economy and for the building of our country. Many people don't know that there were pensions for Civil War veterans funded by the federal government, a union or by states, paid $8 or $30 a month for union soldiers, less generate Confederate states, limbs. You had to lose body parts, you get more money. The concept of ex slaves pensions was introduced and pension bill HR 11119, filed by Representative William Connell of Nebraska in 1890. The request by Walter Vaughn, a Democrat of Omaha, who wanted tax relief plan for ex-slave pension recipients to spend in the South. Racial segregation officially became the law of the land with the US Supreme Court's 1896. You gotta know Plessy v. Ferguson. This was uh, Trump's election to the Obama year. This was the black backlash to all that progress. This was a slave, uh, um, a national ex-slave neutral relief bounty and pensions association policy. Uh, White Lash, political tar cartoon by Thomas Nass published in Harper's Weekly, September 5th, 1868, depicted standing atop a black Civil War veteran are the Five Points Irishman, Ku Klux Klan founder, Nathan Bedford Forrest and Wall Street financier and Democrat, August Belmont. This was the campaign for whiteness. Right? This is what we see when you have some progress. There's always ebbs and flows of history. We should know that past is prologue. When you make progress, there's a backlash to progress. So if there's a campaign to those white folks to say, wait a minute, um, I don't necessarily believe they should slay, be slaves, but I don't necessarily want them living next to me. I don't want them necessarily taking my jobs either. That leads to the 7.4 million people who voted for Donald Trump. You make an appeal that maybe there's a deal with the devil. You make a Faustian bargain because maybe you don't want Black Lives Matter. Maybe you don't want gays in the military. Maybe you think we're 
you're becoming a little too liberal, but you don't like his racist rhetoric, but you vote for him anyway. I want to, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to cover just a few more quick ones um, to the folks that are organizers for tonight. Capital insurrection. The photographer captured a man waving a Confederate battle flag in front of two portraits of Civil War era figures in the Capitol building. Some of you may have seen this. On the right is a portrait of Senator Charles Sumner, Republican from Massachusetts, who protested slavery. On the left, in that uh, protester holding the sign, the Confederate flag, that insurrectionist, on the left is a portrait of John C. Calhoun, the seventh US president and vice president and a staunch defender of slavery. I, there's an irony in this, by the way. On May 22nd, 1856, in the world's greatest deliberative body, Representative Preston Brooks, a Democrat from South Carolina, entered the Senate chamber and savagely beat Charles Sumner in unconsciousness with a metal top cane for his rhetoric, his rhetoric against uh, John C. Calhoun, as well as his, his, his uh, uh, opposition to slavery. Ironically, Brooks, who became a hero to pro-slavery movement, walked away calmly, as they did on January 6th, without being detained, as Sumner bled profusely and was carried away. Brooks survived censure and later resigned. I, I just, the quick reference for my colleague, Robin Williams, this on the call, we talk about unions and uh, the, the discrimination the, the, uh, uh, that existed in the labor market and how the Pullman car porters and the history behind that is critical to understanding the labor movement. Plessy v. Ferguson, what I mentioned, a uh, separate, a doctrine that came, became known as separate but equal. I guess we don't have time to cover that much. Uh, I want to talk about lynchings across the country. NAACP born out of lynchings. The 1908 Springfield race riot where two black men were accused of attacks on white women way before Tulsa, Oklahoma. Those two black men were uh, jailed. This was the birthplace of Abraham Lincoln, Springfield, Illinois. And when the townspeople found out the two black men had been accused of tax on, attacks on white women way before Emmett Till and the accusation against him by baby. They marched on that prison in Springfield, Illinois in, in 1908. And uh, the white sheriff and uh, white businessmen had moved, I believe, those two black men out of the town some 40 or so miles. When the townspeople found out that they had moved those two black men, they went on a killing spree, on a burning spree, again, way before Tulsa. A uh, white writer, William English Walling, wrote an article called Race War in the North, birthplace of Abraham Lincoln. It was wed by white women like Mary White Ovington. It was charging up people like uh, W.B. Du Bois, who had just was in the midst of organizing the Niagara movement. Black men who had come together, like William Monroe Trotter and others, to organize around racial injustice in this country. And even they struggled, right? Struggled with the ideological difference and should you involve white people and should you not? And uh, what's the right tone and what's the right strategy as they ordered, organized the Niagara But I tell you this story because it gave birth to the NAACP when it became the National Negro Committee or the National Negro Committee of 40, which would eventually become the NAACP by 1909. I need you to know about those race lynchings between 1835 and 1964. Over 4,000, I think somewhere between 4,000, 5,000 lynchings across the country. And of course, that's an undercount because there was no real tracking of, of Black lives, the murder of Black lives across this country. But there is some data that charts out as you see those orange dots on that map across the country of the murder of African-Americans. Now, we know there was an unsanctioned murder, but there was also judicial murder. We also know that systems and systems convicted Black men and women to murder, and that's also a lynching. I need you to know that as we talk about Amy Cooper in Central Park, you can't talk about Amy Cooper and her, her claim that uh, the bird watcher, Mr. Cooper, is attacking her without knowing about Birth of a Nation. That 1950 American silent epic drama film directed and co-produced by D.W. Griffith, he said as a, in an interview, he said, the truth, what is the truth? That film that starred Lillian Gish and the best actor of the time was an epic film. If it were not racist and a Ku Klux Klan propaganda film, it would still be talked about every year we talk about the Oscars and the greatest films of all time. Grand spectacle, masterful, masterful scenes, silent film. It had large casts, large uh, extras and, and battle scenes that it reconstructed the Civil War and quite frankly lied about the Civil War. There's a classic scene, of course, where the 
the, the black man and white, white man in black face is chasing the white woman and she'd rather jump off the cliff than to be attacked by the black man. This was as a white, as a black historian called it, this was white racial pornography. Commercial success, first film shown in the White House, Woodrow Wilson. You may not have known 10,000 black folks marched on downtown Boston led by William Monroe Trotter to shut that film down. I played in a film about that uh, moment in history called Birth of, a, Birth of a Movement. Look it up. I play Trotter as I lead 10,000 black folks on downtown Tremont Street to shut that film down. Because I knew as William Monroe Trotter, I knew that this white racial pornography would lead to more violence against black people. And in fact, it did. It led to the rebirth of the Ku Klux Klan. It led to more uh, enrollment. It led to uh, what would become a decade or two of more violence against African-Americans by the KKK. Many people don't know about Red Summer. So I don't want to talk about Ferguson and Baltimore or Minneapolis in the wake of uh, George Floyd if we're not going to have a conversation about Red Summer. After the Treaty of Versailles, which formally ended World War I, Black veterans returned and were forced to grab their guns, some positioning themselves on rooftops in their neighborhoods in Washington, D.C. They prepared for mob violence in July of 1919. That's why it's called Red Summer, 1919, where there were blockades around historically HBCU Howard University. White sailors recently home from the war had been on days long drunken rampage, assaulting and in some cases lynching Black people on the Capitol streets. The relentless onslaught proved contagious, escalating in dozens of cities across the US in what became known, as I said, the Red Summer. Racist attacks in 1919 were widespread. Again, before Tulsa. Often indiscriminate, but in many places they were initiated by white servicemen and centered on the 380,000 black vets who had just returned from World War I. I need you to see in the top right-hand corner the plotting of just some of those race massacres across the country, DC. You would see Elaine, Arkansas, Rosewood, if you ever seen the movie Rosewood by 1923, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921, East St. Louis, 1917. This is history we all should know. The member of the 369th Infantry Regiment, AKA the Helm Horrified Hellfighters, were awarded the, the coveted Croix de Guerre from the French government when they headed home after World War I, 1919 to Jim Crow. Imagine that contradiction that you fought for your country and you come home and you're still not equal. The great migration, some million people had moved north by this time, of course, we're fleeing the south, right? This is the warmth of other suns. We're fleeing the south, but we're also running in to that tension with those other immigrants, white immigrants, many of whom were also need not apply, that were also discriminated, but then they discriminated against African-Americans because if you came into this country, after the potato famine or whatever your circumstance and whatever country you came from and you were white, you came in with the understanding that at least you're not black. So you gotta understand the great migration. Six million African-Americans moved out of the rural South US to the urban Northeast, Midwest and the West between 1916 and 1970. Black population in Chicago between 1910 and 1920 grew by 148%. Philadelphia, 500% tension in cities like Boston and Chicago and, and, and Minnesota. This is what was going on at that time period. Black man drifts into a white only section in, in Michigan Avenue, there in the, uh, the lakefront, the ocean front, not ocean, lakefront, and drifts into the whites only section. He's stoned to death by the white um, people at the uh, beach at that time. And it leads to days of riots in Chicago. The New Deal, or as I call it, the Raw Deal, the Great Depression was a severe worldwide economic depression that took place during the 1930s, beginning uh, in the US. The New Deal was a series of programs, public work projects, financial reforms, and regs enacted by Franklin uh, Delano Roosevelt between 1933 and 1939, responded to the need for relief. Financial reforms called the three R's, relief, financial reforms, and recovery from the Great Depression. African-Americans were particularly vulnerable to the depression since we worked marginal, unskilled service jobs. African-Americans were discharged as employers often preferred white workers or preserved work for them when there were layoffs. Three times more African-Americans on public assistance than white workers. That's why people ask us why we have three times more unemployed across the country or in our individual cities. Uh, you gotta know this history. 
benefits were less and were excluded from unions. So as we talk, Robin, about the history of unions, many of these uh, unions then and some now did not have a, a history of inclusion of black and brown folks. Homeowners Loan Corporation. In the late 1930s, HOLC graded neighborhoods into four categories based in large part on their racial makeup, makeup neighborhoods with minority occupants were marked in red, hence redlining and consider high risk for mortgage lenders. You know this history of, of redlining, so I won't cover much of that. Um, the data, who owns wealth in the United States? But you gotta connect the dots. That's why we're quantum leaping, right? Is that you have to be able to connect where we are versus, I wanna just take a pause as we sort of wind down because we won't cover all these slides. The reason why I do this presentation, I'm a kid from a housing project. My mother was a single mother who moved up from Alabama for the warmth of other sons. I grew up in a neighborhood where my sister was a crack addict. She was a gang member, a crack addict. Many of the kids I grew up with were murdered over the course of my lifetime. When we went downtown, we were followed around the department store. We were, my uncles were all uh, either, either my miles or they were black activists. They were all jailed or incarcerated or dead. I couldn't drive a car in my early years without being stopped by the police. So when I was a little kid growing up in the neighborhood, I said to myself, what is wrong with us? What's wrong with us as black people that we don't, we don't live as long? We're incarcerated, they stop us, they don't, they don't trust us, they, our education systems are poor, our neighborhoods are bad. What's wrong with us? Then I visit family in Birmingham and Tuscaloosa and the same thing. I visit family in Rochester, New York, north of New York City, same thing. I come to college in Minnesota and I see the same thing. I go visit family in Chicago, same thing. I go visit family in Memphis, same thing. Here's what happens, you internalize that because you don't have the context. You don't know how we got here. That's what Quantum Leap was all about. So when you understand wealth gaps in the United States, according to data from Federal Reserve in 1990, white households own 90.7% of the household wealth in the United States, whereas black households own 3.8 and Hispanic households 2.1. How did we get here? The average net worth per capita among white Americans is roughly 437,000 per person, whereas the value is $105,000 among black people and 53,000 among Hispanic people. Now that may tip, that data may have changed, shifted, but the disparities are still there. So share of demographics by wealth, I won't cover that. To skiing simplest, because I couldn't get off this presentation. I know I'm running late, so I know y'all are probably pulling your hair out right now with this, but I, I want to get some of this in. 1932 to 1972, why won't we take a vaccine? In the fall of 1932, the flyers began appearing around Macon County, Georgia, Macon County, Alabama, promising colored people special treatment. I need you to understand that the science of this period, not quack doctors, the science of this period thought that we were the syphilis-soaked race, that we had bad blood. So if you're on this call and you know about Tuskegee syphilis, know 600 black men who were in this study and how it was unethical, just like J. Marion Sims, there was a treatment for syphilis. There was anesthesia for those black women that they didn't get during J. Marion Sims' experimentation. I didn't even mention that earlier. I need you to understand this about Tuskegee syphilis, that the reality is that this medical system is always taking advantage of black bodies. They've always experimented on black lives. So that's why we didn't get in clinical trial. Now, if you're on this call, you say, well, my kids don't know about Tuskegee syphilis. Um, I don't even know about some of this stuff. And I always tell people, you ever walk down the street with a parent who, who doesn't want you to walk down that street when they're not with you because it's a bad neighborhood and they hold your hand tight or they give you a warning. I don't ever want your behind walking down the street. That's what happens in the medical profession. I ain't letting them white folks experiment on me. I ain't going to that hospital, you go there to die. I ain't, I ain't taking that medicine, I don't know what they put in it. So you don't necessarily know the, the narrative behind the Tuskegee syphilis experiment or Henrietta Lacks or J. Marion Sims or the many other examples. But what you do know is you don't trust them. So we gotta confront that history. GI Bill, another example of why there's a, a wealth gap in this country, the Servicemen Readjustment Act of 1944, commonly known as the GI Bill, was a law that provided a range of benefits for returning World War II veterans. The bill aimed to help American World War II veterans adjust to civilian life by providing benefits, including low cost mortgages, low interest loans, and financial support. African Americans did not benefit nearly as much as white Americans. 
The benefits included college tuition, low cost home loans and unemployment insurance. Here's why it matters. The original GI Bill ended by July 1956. By that time, nearly 8 million World War II veterans had received education or training and 4.3 million home loans were $33 billion had been handed out. But most black veterans had been left behind as, unemployment, as employment, college attendance and wealth surged for whites, disparities with their black counterparts not only continued but widened. If many people don't know, many black veterans were dishonorably discharged. There were systems, there were practices that kept us screened off from these opportunities. So when you understand it's not really about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, because many white folks didn't do that. That it's not about, about being naturally smart, because many white folks were not any smarter than black folks. It's about opportunity. It's about whether the next infrastructure bill, as you're sitting on this call right now, if they reach a compromise on the infrastructure bill, that train may miss us too. It may not be the black general contractor or the, the Latinx general contractor that gets that business. In fact, it probably won't be. So that pipeline to the middle class or that pipeline to entrepreneurship will not be you and I, unless we're vigilant and we understand the context of history. It repeats itself. Henrietta Lacks, you know that story now. Black woman treated unsuccessfully with cervical cancer in 1951 at John Hopkins. Um, she was the source for the HeLa cell line, the first immortalized human cell line and one of the most important cell lines in medical research. But of course, the unethical part, they didn't tell her. <laughs> they didn't give her consent. They didn't get her family's consent. And yet she contributed to the medical advancement. I'm going to wind down this right now, and I'm going to end it at Brown v. Board of Education. And if uh, folks want me to come back and do the other half of this presentation, I will. But I want to go to this. Two more things I want to show you. Emmett Till was born on July 25th, 1941. Why do we reference Emmett Till? I'm gonna tell you, I cry every time I talk about Tamir Rice. Cause I was that little boy who as improper as this is today that used to run around in the parks in Roxbury playing cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers. I used to run around with my little toy gun and roll over and pretend and I can imagine when they pulled up within feet of him that day, he probably put that toy to say, hey, this is just a toy as they shot him and took his life. Oops, just like they did with that black couple in Minneapolis when I was there. Born in 1925, 19, uh, July 25th, 1941 in Chicago, Illinois, the son of Mamie Carthen and Lewis Till. Part of the great migration I talked about as a young child when her family moved from the Delta region of Mississippi uh, to Argo, Illinois, of Mississippi to Margo, Illinois, raised in Chicago. Emmett became known uh, by his teens, the sharp dress. If you've seen the picture, that's a sharp brother with a great sense of humor who couldn't, who wouldn't have been fully understanding like I was. I was a Boston kid, so when they sent me to Alabama, I, I didn't know what to say. I was saying lie. I was getting whoopings for saying lie. You can't say lie. That's a bad word in the South. It wasn't a bad word in Boston, right? They, I didn't know that. And even when I went to the South, you couldn't say things to white folks. You couldn't disrespect white folks. Even when I was a child, he didn't fully understand the racial constraints of life in the Jim Crow South. August 28, 1955, while visiting family in Money, Mississippi, 14-year-old Emmett was brutally murdered for allegedly flirting with a white woman four days earlier, as they claim, and he said, bye, baby. More narrative than I have time to cover here. The blood of Emmett Till. Read the book. His assailants, the white woman's husband, and Emmett carry a 75-pound cotton gin fan to the bank of the Tallahatchie River and ordered him to take off his clothes. The two men then beat him nearly to death, gouged out his eye, shot him in the head, and then threw his body tied to a cotton gin fan with barbed wire into the river. This is hard history that every person on this call and every white person and every Latinx person and every person on this earth needs to know Emmett Till's story. They need to understand that context. Then they'll, they'll cry for Tamir Rice in the way that they need to. They'll understand that this is not a new for, for America. This too is America. Justice delayed is justice denied. September, 50, September 1955, an all white jury found Roy Bryant and his half-brother, J.W. Millam, not guilty of Till's kidnapping and murder, protected against double jeopardy. The two men publicly admitted in a 1956 interview with Look Magazine that they had killed Till. Now, here's what you may not have known. This is the little twist I'm throwing in for this presentation, because I found this out when I read the trial transcript today. The trial transcript from the testimony of Moses Preacher Wright, the uncle, and you'll see the Q&A there. He said, in, as the uh, question came from the attorney, and he could make you understand him, is that right? That's right. 
the uncle said. And how tall was he? Uh, well, it looked like Emmett was about five feet and three or four inches. And how much did he weigh? 150. Did he look like he was pretty well grown? Was he a pretty good sized man? He looked like a man. This is not new. The narrative of creating our little kids, the uh, 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 Trayvon Martin, the, the Tamir Rice's, the many other who get murdered across this country. They've been always, the narrative is that, oh, it was justified. He looked like a man. Now, some of this data, I'll close it on this with racial statistics, right? What we think of reparations, and that's divided across the country. At one time in this poll, 50% of whites said that we should to make up for the harm caused by slavery and other forms of racial discrimination. 58% of African-Americans said they sh we should. 81% whites said we should not. 35 African-Americans said we should not. But I want you to look at the other side. Most black adults have negative views about the country's racial progress. This is old poll, right? Not even old in terms of, um, it's really relatively recent, but everything is, we can look at life as pre-George Floyd and after George Floyd. Race relations in the US are generally bad. White people said 56%, black 71%. Trump has made race relations worse. 49% said white said yes. 73% of black said yes. Old poll. The legacy of slavery affects the position of black people in American society today a great deal or fair amount. White, 58, black, 84. Our country hasn't gone far enough in giving black equal rights with whites. 37 white, 78 black. Not to or not at all likely that black people will eventually have equal rights, 7%, 50%. But here's a more recent poll done right after the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. NPR, PBS uh, poll. As a way to make up for the harm caused by slavery and other forms of racial discrimination, do you think the United States should or should not pay reparations? That is, should or should not pay money to African-Americans who are descendants of slaves? That question was posed, and, and I want you to draw you to that poll to see for yourself the answers to some of these questions. Three quarters of American adults agree with the guilty verdict of former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin. Three quarters of American adults Derek Chauvin, the murder of George Floyd, although about half of Republicans and Trump supporters think it was either the wrong decision or they aren't sure. So that's the divide among parties. But I want you to remember this. But for that video that we thought was eight minutes and 46 seconds that became nine minutes and 29 seconds, would we have these results? Would there be a greater divide among um, even Black Americans? As I can tell you as a black activist who's led an NAACP branch for six years, if you don't know, if you don't have the evidence, if we can't uh, subpoena the records, if we can't get the tape, if we can't see the videotape, that's how they win. Because it sows even doubt among black folks. You say, well, maybe he did resist. He was a big dude. Maybe he did fight back. Maybe he was on drugs. I wish the brother had just just complied. But that's the problem is we never get the truth because they never give us access. That's why we need body cameras. That's why we need had to have access to the, to the footage. That's why we need civilian review. That's why we need criminal justice reform. Because I don't trust you to tell me the truth. Because you never have. On the question of whether white supremacy represents the most lethal terrorist threat to the homeland today, as President Biden made reference to, a majority of women said it does, while a majority of men said it doesn't. I, wanted to, I would like to dig into why women and men even think differently about these issues. The percentage of Americans saying race relations are worse than a year ago has declined. Most Americans believe police use, force guide, police use of force guidelines should be reformed. That's a growing trend. A majority of Americans think race relations will be better for future generations with younger people most likely to say so. Interesting. It is just one poll. Just 30% of American adults say they have often or sometimes personally experienced discrimination or been treated unfairly because of their race or ethnicity. Just 15% of whites say they've experienced discrimination and been treated unfairly based on their race, while 61% of Black Americans or 39% of Latino people say they have. And, and Professor al I challenge Black folks when they tell me that. So I ain't never experienced racism. I don't, I've, I've been, you know, I just live my life. I always said, and you don't know what racism is because you're not thinking about the asthma rates in your community. You're not thinking about the fact that your 
disparately poor or the first laid off or not compensated the same. You've been weathered to racism. So that number would probably be higher if even the white Americans understood what racism is. Republicans, 91% were far more likely than Democrats, 62% to say that they have at least a fair amount of confidence in police in their communities to gain trust of local residents. Just 40%, 46% of black adults express at least a fair amount of confidence in local police, uh, that local police can, can be trusted, can gain their trust. 61% of Black Americans also said they think local police treat people of color more harshly than white people, while just a quarter of white respondents agreed. I'm going to end it there because there's so much more. And I'm just going to show you how much more there is. The history of transportation and Ida B. Wells, who didn't give up her seat way before Rosa Parks. Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a young movement way before Black Lives Matter, way before these young protesters. And Ella Baker's warning to them not to come under Dr. King and the older civil rights organizations to stay independent or Congressman Clyburn getting in good trouble and Bloody Sunday in Birmingham or Birmingham and those incidents in Birmingham. You need to understand the, the strategy behind Birmingham. Those four little girls and actually the fifth girl who was injured, but those four little girls who died and say their names, know their stories. And those kids, as we now call it, the Children's Crusade, who Quite frankly, even Malcolm X and Dr. King would have disagreed over whether that was a good strategy, but those kids protesting shook the consciousness of America as Bull Connor turned those dogs and those hoses on children. Racism in the healthcare system, how segregation was pervasive in this country, medical experimentation, the birth of, I mean, doctors by race and where they're trained. There's so much more, and I'm not gonna cover it tonight, the Kernel Report, violence, say their names, know their stories. I'm gonna, I could dig in more to some of these stories behind some of these murders across the country. Um, my favorite phrase, if you're not at the table, you're on the table or you're on the menu. Professor Okadi, if you're not at the table, you're on the table or you're on the menu. I've made it my life mission to be at the table like Robin Williams who's on this call, or Reverend Liz Walker who's on this call. So many others across this country who make it a point that to either pull up our own seat or bum rush the meeting to make sure that we have a seat at the table so that our people don't end up on the menu. And then a quote that I hope to be known for one day, Professor Okada, is it takes time for truth to catch up to history because there's a whole bunch of BS in, in our books and in these stories. And now we're forcing the issue to tell the truth. I'm gonna thank you and stop there because I know I took up a lot of your time, um, but oh, I got wow. really caught up in trying to share that history with you. Yes, we want to um, just unmute and thank you for your presentation. Everybody give him a round of applause and woo, woo, woo. Great. It was great. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. Cool. Um, so now we do have a little bit of time for uh, some questions. And then we, we're going to, as customary, this is a lot. Um, and actually, all it does is set you up to come back to the new school. How about that? So you can finish telling us, you know, all that you had. Uh, there's so much, so much in this. And um, I can see why uh, Elder you know, Professor Mahmoud has such high regard for you. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it. So, um, <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, we're going to, we do have one question. I want to just have people put questions in the chat so we can kind of get a couple of questions. And then we're going to, um, I, I, I see that Elder wants to say something. I'm going to just, let's just hang on for just a second and then we'll um, just answer a couple of questions. So let's see here. The question was, uh, what do you think about this move to ban teaching about slavery and civil rights uh, that has been passed in Texas and moving across the country? Oklahoma, I got a colleague, a friend of mine, uh, Regina Goodwin, who is a representative there. They're dealing with that in, in Oklahoma. Should African-Americans begin a counter movement to protest for this protest against uh, critical race theory? And is it just a way to censor and tighten the controls of what is taught in public schools. So I'm gonna answer that real quick because I know we wanna get some questions, but I, I'll answer it as succinctly as possible. So I think um, one is, um, you know, oftentimes I use this phrase that we're asking people to invest in their own demise. 
right? When you ask us to have more DEI, it means that they, if they're very tribal in their thinking, if they've not read Dr., uh, my Professor Alcadi's work around race, they get very tribal and they think, okay, letting more of them in means less of me. Well, history works the same way. If you've been the hero or the shero, then you're investing in your own demise to tell the truth. That, uh, that black folks have been screened off from opportunity, we've been murdered, we've been screened off from health insurance. And, and by the time you figured out you had cancer because you didn't have a health insurance, you had stage four. And before the Affordable Care Act, many black folks did not have insurance across this country. It was a form of discrimination. So we're in this place right now where uh, white Americans are nervous that we might know the truth. Now, I'm gonna tell you as a, 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 a McAllister student, when my mood started giving me all this history in class, I got angry first. That's the stages you go through. Mm -hmm. I started turning over some tables on campus. I, I became even more confrontational with my white colleagues in class. Uh, I even would come back to the dorm room and want to share it with them, but they couldn't receive it because it, it undermined their notion of their privilege, of their superiority, even if they weren't conscious of it. They couldn't hear about this history. And it took time, quite frankly, Professor. Some of them came around three, four years later, and then they got it. And maybe now, post McAllister, they're now activists, white activists in this movement. But I can tell you one of the reasons is because people are going to tether themselves to a lie, just like they did with January 6th. And you have to pry them off a lie. We got to pry them. So critical race theory, of course, the backlash. They don't understand it. They don't even know what race is. They don't even know what racism is. They don't even know what Black history is or American. They don't even know American history. They don't even know their own history. So we got to challenge that history. That's why, Professor, I'm a student of all history. You made me that way. I know the French Revolution. I can tell you about the French Revolution. I can tell you about parts of history I had no interest in because once I understood Black history, I understood our interconnection with all history. And that you want to be persuasive to anybody you got to connect to their story. So I think, yes, we got a battle, but I'm excited. I, you know, I said this professor in a, an interview I did recently, I said, we got racism on the run because of people like those Black Lives Matter folks there in Minneapolis, St. Paul, because of activists on this call. Racism on the run because they knew time was limited. And that's why they're fighting back just like they did during Reconstruction. There's another question. No, if you want to, you wanted to weigh in, and then we're gonna go into breakout. Yeah. You, you want me to weigh? Yeah. No. Okay. Oh, is what I want to say is this: Need I say more? No. <laughs> <laughs> and there you have it. <laughs> okay. So um, I want to um, just put. Um, there was a couple of questions that you had given us. Um, I want to give you an opportunity. We probably only have time to really focus in on one thing. We're going to go to our breakout sessions now for small group discussion, and then we'll bring everybody back. We'll have about 10 minutes for that, and then we'll bring us all back to sort of conclude our class tonight. Um, uh, Michael, can you give us, we, we have, what does the backlash to racial justice look like today as compared to the backlash in the decades following emancipation and reconstruction? Uh, you gave us a whole lot. Do you have one thing that we should go away and discuss among ourselves and then come back to, uh, to, to the group? Yeah, I think, you know, one, and just some of this is uh, the other two questions are critical to think about, if not tonight, is whether this is a moment or a movement. Okay. And I think if you've studied with Dr. with uh, Professor Al-Qadi, then you've studied movements and whether this is a moment or a movement, how differently does America view racism today versus uh, the pre-George Floyd? People see that as uh, uh, before Christ and after Christ, as pre-George and after George, right? But we know that there was many other stories and that was a succession of incidents that was a tipping point. That's what George Floyd represents. But I think to that third question as we go into breakout is racial justice look like today, right? We, we know that we don't all agree on what defund means, right? You have a, a view uh, in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and, and we thank you across the country for leading that moment, that, that movement to relook at how we do policing in this country. You've been the, the tip of the spear with that work. Um, 
let's talk about that backlash to racial justice. Because again, we should be anticipating what happens next. Donald Trump was predictable. Whether you knew it or not, Donald Trump was predictable post Barack Obama. If you, if you paid attention to Professor Okadi in class, you would have known it was coming. You would have saw that train coming down the track. Let's talk about what the other manifestations of back, backlash look like today. Okay, well, Brian, we're, I think we're ready to uh, go to breakouts and um, then we'll come back in about seven minutes and everybody should go out and that'll give uh, Michael you a little bit of time to chat with Elvin. How about that? <laughs> Michael, you just stay in the uh in the main room. Okay.